Well, hello there to our online people. My name is Josh, and you probably see me every single week on these videos, and I just wanna say hello, welcome. Like, this is the time, and these, uh, like, before service uh, videos that we have for you are just for you. No one else sees these. No one who's sitting in the worship center right now is watching this or hearing this. Whatever it may be, this is just for you. And we wanted to make something that is special for, for you if you're watching at home with family or friends, if you're on the go and driving and you're listening to this in your car, whatever it may be, this is only for you. And so we just want to say thank you. Thank you for watching and allowing us to be a part of your worship experience today. And you know, today is, a, is going to be a really cool day. We're starting this new series in the book of Ephesians. Um, and we're just really excited. You know, we just finished this, I think it's been like 35 weeks or so of this thing called The Story, uh, where we just went through the Bible in a chronological order. And it was such an amazing time for our church to really just unify in what God was doing within our family. Uh, and now we're starting specifically on the book of Ephesians, and we're really stoked about this. You know, the book of Ephesians is, is one of those books that kind of shows that God's love is for everyone. It's a, a book that kind of uh, takes the the boundaries of what we thought the gospel message was for and breaks those down and says, no, the gospel message is for everyone. No matter your age, no matter your gender, no matter your ethnicity, whatever it may be, God's word, God's truth, God's love is for you. And that's why we're so excited. You know, here in Meridian, we have an expanding uh, community. You know, people are moving in here from everywhere and from different cities, from different states. And we're just excited at the opportunity that God has given us to really connect with our community in this way. So as we are watching or you are listening, whatever it may be, however you're connecting with us in this worship service, I just want to say welcome and, and just, you know, use this time to get your heart right. Get your heart ready for what God has in store. You know, we, we put on a plan every single week and we say, okay, we're going to do this, this, this. We're going to talk about these things. We're going to sing these songs. But ultimately, God's plan is what we follow. And so let's just focus in on what God is doing in your heart right now. Go ahead and take some time to grab your communion elements, whether that be just some crackers, some juice, whatever it may be, put it on a table, put it off to the side. We're gonna take communion as a family together because that's what community does. When it comes together, gathers around a table and enjoys this meal that God has invited us into. So we're gonna do that later on in the service, but right now we're just gonna focus in on all that God has done. Take this time, maybe take a deep breath in, breathe out, and just allow God to work in your life right now. You know, one of the, the amazing things that I just really, uh, every week get an encounter as I come to a time of worship, it's not uh, the fact that, yeah, I get to gather with all my friends and my family and just get to worship and know that all around the world, people are watching and listening to a message that is loving and inspired by God. But what I get to encounter is the way that God works in my life. I get to encounter the way that God is working on my heart each and every Sunday. Each and every time that I watch a message, I get to just focus in on how God is working in my life. So whatever day you're watching this, whether you're watching live on Sunday with us right now or if you're watching sometime later on in the week, just allow God to move in your heart. Allow God to work in your life. Because that's when, when we just give up our life, when we just surrender to all that God is doing, that's when he moves in ways that we can like not even understand. God is a good God. He is working, he is moving in your life. And right now, we're about ready to jump into service, but just let him work in your heart. Let him work in your life. And right after the service, I want to come back and I just want to pray with you and, and talk to you. So stay tuned right after service. But right now, we have about 10 seconds or so. We're going to go back into worship with, with everyone else. And let's just work. let God work in your life through singing, through his word, through communion, whatever it may be. God is good and he's working through Good you. morning, 10 Mile Christian Church. It is great to have you here today. Let's, uh, let's worship God together. Would you stand for you watching online? Uh, get cozy. We're just going to have you... Have you sing along with us? Let's do it. Um, we're going to start in just a second. How is everyone? We're going to try this one more time. Um, I'm going to open us in prayer as I fix this technology. God, would you just... Uh, pour a blessing out on this day. Allow our technology to work. Um, we don't need it to praise you, but uh, it would be nice. I know you're going to have your Holy Spirit move in just a moment. Um, but God, thank you for, even though we're having a rough week, uh, a lot of us just kind of taking in <clears throat> what it is to, um, to just deal with grief and deal with loss and 
to deal with things that don't make sense in this world. God, um, we just pray that you uh, help help us with that peace that surpasses all understanding and uh, let your will be done on this earth, God. We know that heaven is coming soon and we're going to give you praise and honor no matter what. No matter what. Okay, there we go. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I want to get this going. I'm ready. Here we go. This is where worship starts, here in the town. Lord, come. 
just want to read uh, from Colossians 1, 13 and 14. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave us our sins. Hallelujah for the cross. In this broken world, we have one true hope. It's our responsibility today to be looking to that hope and sharing it. Let's do it together. Yeah. 
would you stay standing as we pray together? Lord Jesus, we thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, we just want to take time in our service to, to pray a prayer of gratitude for those who have gone before us. Lord, we know that there is no freedom without you. There's no freedom without what you have done in coming before us and offering your son, Jesus, as a sacrifice for us. And Lord, we just want to, to honor those who have come before us and who have sacrificed their lives for our freedom in this country. Lord Jesus, we are so honored and grateful. And Lord, I just ask that anyone who is remembering this weekend, a loved one, Lord, that I just, I just pray a blessing over them, a loved one who's passed and who served and who gave their life. I pray a blessing over them and their family. And Lord, we thank you for your ultimate sacrifice and what you've done on the cross for us. And we, we honor you and we praise you for that as well. Lord, I pray a blessing over our worship service today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning. Welcome. So glad that we get to worship together this morning. So thankful um, and encouraged by the opportunity to gather together in worship. If it's your first time, we just want to say welcome. We're so glad that you're here today. Um, we would love to meet you. We have a room right out these doors, our guest central room, where, where you can go and you can meet some of our ministers and our staff um, and just connect and, and kind of get to know a little bit more about what's happening here at 10 Mile. But if you've been here before, if, if this is your home church, we want to welcome you as well. We're so glad um, that you're here. If, when you came in, you should have received a handout. And on the bottom of that handout is a connection card. And if you're worshiping online with us, you can go online to the website or you can even go on our app and find a connection card there. We would just love to get to know you a little bit better and to know how we can best walk alongside you, whether you're interested in engaging in the life of this church in a, in a way, or if you're interested in making your next step with Jesus, or if we can just be praying with you. Because our ministers, our staff, and our prayer warriors of the church, we pray over those prayer requests every single week. So they don't just go into some abyss, they get prayed for. So please let us know how we can be praying for you. This moment in our service is a time where we set aside for gratitude. And so we just, we just like to acknowledge that, that God has given us every good gift that we have received. And we know that, that we would have nothing were it not for him. Just like I prayed earlier, that God, his sacrifice gave us our freedom. And so we just respond grateful. And we thank him for what he's done. And we know that in his word, he asks us to give back to him. And so if that's what you would like to do this morning, if you'd like to give a gift to God through 10 Mile, the ways that you can do that are on the screen behind me. But right now I would love to pray for our gratitude. Lord Jesus, we just thank you. We thank you for the good gifts that you've given us. We thank you um, for our ability to be comfortable and to have our needs met, Lord. And if there's anyone in this room that, that is suffering, that, that doesn't have their needs met, Lord, I just, I just pray that, that you would walk alongside them, that you would give them comfort, Lord. But I pray that, that in this time we would surrender our tithes and offerings to you, and Lord, that you would just take those and you would do beyond what we could imagine with them. For the hundreds, for the thousands, for the millions, that you would bring them closer to you through what we give and surrender to you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. my wife, Michaela, to stay up here with me because uh, we'd just like to open um, up in prayer this morning. Um, would you pray with us? Father in heaven, 
It's been two weeks uh, since we finished up the story, um, studying through the whole Bible. Um, And in those past two weeks, there's just been so much hurt in our world. Um, God, and we just ask, we just ask a question, Lord, why is there so much hurt in this world, Lord? We pray that you might come quickly, Lord, because we believe that one day you will come back and that, that you will wipe every tear, Lord, and that you, on this Memorial Day weekend, Lord, you will make all the wrongs right and that you will resurrect all those who have died and who are asleep in you when you come again. And so we think, Lord, about, uh, we think about our community and we think about the ones um, out of our control across our country, like California and Buffalo and Texas, and the suffering and the hurt and the evil in this, in this world that we live in. And we ask that you would come quickly, Lord. And when you come quickly, Lord, we ask that you would make the wrongs right and that you would wipe every tear and that you would just hold those who are hurting today. And this weekend, as Michaela prayed, this Memorial Day weekend, we just ask that you would draw near to those who have a hole in their heart, who have an ache in their stomach today. Um, thinking about the hurt in our country and the world, Lord, we ask that you would just draw near to those who seek comfort and who ask why this weekend. And they ask and they look for where you are in the world and they don't see you, Lord. I ask that you would appear and that you would show them Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that we only have hope and that we only have, have our faith that we only ever have rest and peace. And so we ask, Lord, all these things and a blessing in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, there's a city, and there's a church, and there's a boy. The city is in the ancient world. It's, it's called the city of Ephesus. The city of Ephesus was known as the greatest city in Asia by the late Roman Empire, somewhere between 50,000 to 150,000 people lived in Ephesus. Even some of the the, the earliest um, estimates of that climbed up to around 200,000 people estimated to live in the city of Ephesus. A massive, a massive amount of people. It was a seaport at the time, and because the river that flows through it flowed into the sea, kind of like a New Orleans situation, um, it, it, over the past 2,000 years, it's silted in. And so the archaeological site, if you see pictures of Ephesus today, is, is many miles actually from the coast now, but it originally was a seaport, one that Paul and the apostles traveled and sailed into. A Greek world traveler, um, one of the ones who sailed around the Mediterranean and and traveled all up the river Euphrates and Tigris and traveled all over the ancient world, a man named Antipater of Sidon. I know, quite a name. He, He traveled around. He wrote in his journal about the seven wonders of the world, and he traveled to Ephesus. And when he traveled to Ephesus, he said, I've seen the pyramids with my own eyes. The great pyramids of Egypt. I've seen the wall of Babylon where you can drive chariots in two lanes next to each other on top of it. I've seen the Colossus at Rhodes, this great bronze statue that stood in the sea harbor at the place in Rhodes. I've seen the hanging gardens. I've seen all of the wonders of the world and none of them compare to the temple at Ephesus. Ephesus was a huge city the queen city of the Roman Empire in Asia. The the temple of Artemis was its crown jewel, this massive city, massive ornate marble temple, about bigger than the size of a football field, up on high, high steps, sitting on the side of the hill. Now, Artemis cult at Ephesus was a strange one. Uh, The Artemis cult revolved around um, this kind of inner sanctum, this grove of of trees, this olive trees where people found rest and they found asylum, even if they were running from crimes. They could come into this space. The the Artemis cult was even stranger, though, and and I won't be too graphic with it, but it was obsessed with uh, sexuality and sexual freedom and and fertility, a lavish, lush, free life with with no restraints on it. it. It was a place... Of revelry, I guess. Ephesus was this gigantic um, city, and in it was a gigantic theater. So I think I actually have a couple of slides. I forgot one. Throw that one up there. This is the city of Ephesus. You can see a picture of the, the temple or like a rendering of it on the side, and it was kind of out of town. You, in the upper left on this like, full screen slide, sorry for the gym and online, I'm just going to be an invisible voice for a bit. Uh, the harbor kind of at the original like downtown street, and the city just filled the valley around 
around the mountains. It's actually quite mountainous in the area. It'd be like if you were in Horseshoe Bend and you had mountains kind of all around you and the river kind of snaked through it. Imagine if there was a harbor kind of up there, up there and it was just the city sprawling through the valley. The next slide shows you the theater at Ephesus. Like this theater is so big. It's about the size of Wrigley Field or like, or Fenway Park or, or it's, it would dwarf like, uh, it's like if you've ever been to the Boise State Stadium, it's like the kind of big half circle at the end zone. Like it's, it's bigger than that. I think in like, I think in 2001 or something, Elton, Elton John played a, played a, a concert at the at theater in Ephesus. They like set it all up and it was like, like 20, 30,000 people like could fit in there. It's huge. It's this massive, uh, any Jethro Tull fans, they've also played Ephesus. And I guess that's like a big, playing Ephesus is a big deal, I guess, uh, in certain, certain circles. Um, the theater is huge. It's this spot where, uh, if you remember in Acts 7, or 19, Paul's preaching the gospel in Ephesus. And then he like sort of whips up this riot, right? And the riot just started to, like starts just kind of snowballing through the town and it ends up with the whole city like gathering together at the theater in Ephesus and they just start chanting and and going nuts and they're like let's go get that Paul and let's snuff out all those Christians and they're like there's a frenzy happening you know we have to get out of the city and Paul's like no I'm gonna go down to the theater and mix it up with those guys like and he goes down to the theater which would be like literally walking into like a major league baseball stadium filled with people chanting wanting to kill you like foaming at the mouth and Paul just walks right in there and he's like let's get let's get in this thing you guys need to know Jesus. I need to tell you about who Jesus is. He can't stop him from doing it. Ephesus. There's four letters written to the church in Ephesus in the New Testament, or somebody in the church of Ephesus. There's four, more than any other specific church in the entire Bible. Five, actually, if you count Paul's letter to the Ephesian elders in Acts 21. It's a church with a lot of talent. It's a church with a lot of wealth. It's a church with a lot of maturity, even. It's a church that's been established. It's a church that has a reputation for sending missionaries out across the world. It's a church that has a reputation for being strong and steadfast in Christ. This summer, we're going to be studying through Paul's letter to Ephesians. Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. This letter in the New Testament, it's one of the most complete, it's one of the most all-encompassing books in the New Testament. It's written strictly and solely to build up the church. It's not really like Romans or Galatians that kind of talk about this specific reason, like like there's something going on in the church in Galatia, and Paul writes a letter to a specific issue, right? It's like, hey, you guys, you're dealing with this thing, I'm going to write about this thing for you. Ephesians is kind of a general letter. It's written only to build up the church. When I used to supply preach uh, while I was in school at little churches across the countryside or, or kind of through the Midwest, I would almost always preach from Ephesians. Because there's always something to talk about in Ephesians. I was talking about this with Steve the other day, and um, he said that Ephesians was the first sermon series that he preached when they handed him the keys to be the preacher at Meridian Christian Church all those years ago. So why not? It's a little fitting. We know that this church, uh, this church in Ephesus and the letter to this church was passed around to other churches too. It's kind of generically written. If you have a, a fairly new Bible, you'll notice that in the, in the footnotes even, in your English Bible, there's probably a footnote after, Ephesus one, or after Ephesians 1.1 1, 1 that says, to the Ephesians is not included in the earliest manuscripts. And I always kind of want to let people know when they read something like that in your footnotes, if, they're, if it's there for you, that don't be alarmed by these things, right? Our English translations are, are really remarkably reliable, and you, you, can really, you can really rely on them. They're, they're good, and so you can trust it. Um, but it is true. The earliest manuscripts, specifically Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, don't have them. And that's likely because the person who took the letter around and read it at churches just filled in the blank wherever they were to the church in Meridian, right? <laughs> It's like, where am I again? You know, you ever been to a concert where the guy or the person like singing says, what's up, Boise? And they're not in Boise. And it's like, what? You know, what's up, Portland? It's like, oh, that's tomorrow night. You know, it's like, oh, all right. Well, uh, this, is, this could be one of those where they just leave it blank and you just fill it in. We know for sure that, the church, that this letter was read in Ephesus. But just like the early letters, they were passed around to other churches around them. 
to, to churches down the road like Thyatira and Smyrna and Sardis. They would have shared it around. Just like in Colossians 4.16, Paul says this to the church in Colossae, right? He says, after this letter, this is the letter to the Colossians, has been read to you, see to it that it's also read in the church of the Laodiceans. So pass it on to them. Let the other churches read it. And when you go down there and give them that letter, read the letter that I wrote to them too. Some people actually think that the, this letter to the Ephesians might actually be that letter to the Laodiceans, that they might have actually shared it and had it at the time. We don't know that. But much of the New Testament's relationship with this city and this church is fleshed out actually in Paul's letters to a young man, a man named Timothy, just a boy in, in the Greek world, who Paul left to minister the big city church in Ephesus. He says this to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.3. He says, as I urged you, Timothy, when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. It's in these letters, First and Second Timothy, that we read the encouragement of an old experienced preacher who's in captivity by then, who's writing letters of encouragement to a young man just starting out with a big ministry challenge in front of him. And in First and Second Timothy, Paul tells Timothy to pre- preach Christ, right? Christ Jesus, who came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst, Paul writes to Timothy. He says that our God and Savior, the Lord, he, he desires all people to be saved and come to the saving knowledge of Christ Jesus, to the saving knowledge of the truth. That's in First Timothy 2. And he also says practical advice in First and Second Timothy, right? He says things like, beware of the love of money, for it is the root of all evil. And we brought nothing into this world, and so we'll take nothing out. That's in 1 Timothy 4. And he says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, Timothy, but instead set an example in faith and purity. That's in 1 Timothy 2. That's in, that's in Ephesus. There's a city, and there's a church, and there's a boy. We'll start Ephesians next week. Next week, we'll hop into that book, and we'll start with chapter 1. But today, we're going to look at one of the other letters to the church in Ephesus, one that we actually just read through if you were doing your reading in the story two weeks ago. So turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation 2, if you have your Bibles today. Otherwise, the words will be on the screen. Um, Revelation 2, 1. Like I said, we just wrapped up the stories. We're studying through the Bible over the past 30-some weeks that we've done it. In the last week of the story, we looked at this book of Revelation. And at the beginning of the book of Revelation, before all of the, 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 the bowls and the trumpets and the, and the beasts and the dragons start coming out, there's just seven letters to seven churches on a mail route in Asia. And Ephesus is the first. Jesus himself tells John to write the letters. The first church is Ephesus. The words of the Lord Jesus to the church in Ephesus. Revelation 2.1. Let's read. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of the one who holds seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds. What do you hear when you hear the word, I know your deeds? I think that if your deeds are holy, or if your deeds are, the deeds are works of Christ, then you, it might be a refreshing thing to hear. It might be something that actually is like rest for your soul. I think about somebody I was talking to a few months ago who was actually falsely accused of something they didn't commit. And oh, to hear the words in a courtroom, I know your deeds. And to know that you're being falsely accused, to know that you're innocent. Oh, it would be rest, wouldn't it? But if your deeds are, are not in the Lord, that wouldn't be a very comfortable thing to hear, would it? If you haven't been where you're supposed to be, if you haven't been up to the stuff that you said you were up to, if you haven't been living the life that you and I, I'm, those might not be comfortable words. I know your deeds, but these are good. 
because this is the church in Ephesus. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that, that you have tested those who've claimed to be apostles but are not and have been found false. That's the word to Timothy, remember? That when, when first and second Timothy, when he says to Timothy, I'm leaving you in Ephesus so that you might weed out and help them through the deb- debates and disputes that they're working through, false teachers, corruption, and leadership, and working out that hard work of righteousness over time. It is a hard work. He leaves them there. I know that you cannot tolerate them. I know you've tested apostles and you've found them false. You have persevered, verse 3, and endured hardships for my name, and you have not grown weary. You've made it through persecution. Verse 4, but I have this against you. I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You've lost your first love, church. You've lost your first love. You've you've forsaken the love you had at first, so consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first, because if you do not repent, I will come and I will remove your lampstand from its place. Now, this first love, it could be referring to, I don't know, I think maybe the, the greatest two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. The first is, the second is like it. I tend to think it's an influence on the first, or the love of God, and it's an influence over the second, right? That they've gotten rid of these false teachers, they've really weeded it out, and they haven't had the wool pulled over their eyes in a long while. They really haven't had had a slick salesman come to their doorstep and sold them a fraud in a long time, but it doesn't really matter. Because they've forgotten the love that they had when they first were in love with Christ. You know the truth, maybe. But you've missed, you've missed me in the middle of it, Jesus says. Verse 6, I have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, this is a sidebar. Don't worry about it. The Nicolaitans, we don't actually know who this group of people is. They are mentioned a number of times in here, but the, and the best guess typically is that they're a movement of Christianity that kind of aligns with that, with that temple of Artemis cult in Ephesus, that they sort of took that freedom in Christ stuff a little bit too far, and, and they are actually started practicing and teaching sin and, and, and evil as if it were something that Christ liberated for us to practice ourselves, right? Some of you are thinking, I might actually know some people like that. I've got some Facebook friends who are Nicolaitans, right? But here we, here we are. Verse 7, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. I think the phrase, I'll give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, it ties in with that phrase, consider how you've fallen, right? It's intentionally pointing us to the garden in Genesis, where the story starts, remember? It's intentionally making us think about where that fall happens, framing our own personal faith in that narrative of creation, fall, redemption story, and how that sort of works together. It's, it's all in the context of those two trees, the beginning and the end. What did your faith look like when you first gave your life to Jesus? What did it look like? Think about that for a second. What did your faith look like when the Holy Spirit first grabbed your heart and the gospel of Jesus just pierced you to the core? What did you feel? What could you say about your life at that moment? What did you do immediately after that? Maybe you aren't a follower of Jesus and you're maybe watching online today or you're maybe in the gym and you just kind of snuck in the back. I'm so glad that you're here and I'm so glad that you're listening and, and participating today because uh, I, hope that you, I hope that you take note of what we're doing today when we come to the throne of grace and when we open this word and the reflection that we do and the scrutiny that we put on our own lives when we ask the hard questions about our own faith, right? Because this word is for a church who's experienced something more than you might call mission drift, right? Or a loss of focus or, a, or maybe a, a scatterbrainedness, right? This is something a little bit different than just steering off course. This is losing their first love. Have you ever had a first love? 
What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word first love? It's a bit of a scary place to, to think about losing anything that you might qualify as a first love. From anything as petty to sitting on the bank saying, I just don't love fishing like I used to love it. To waking up next to somebody that you feel like you don't even know anymore. To saying prayers that you feel are empty. I don't want to make light of it. I mean, maybe that's you today. Maybe that's someone you know that they're just sort of going through the motions or maybe they're not even doing that anymore with the motions. They're just numb and they're bitter. They've lost their first love. They've lost their first love. I was baptized when I was a kid. I I remember um, young in elementary school, about third grade-ish, and I remember it's one of my deepest memories. I I don't know how to explain it even, my my baptism. I I truly don't know how to explain it. I remember everything about the day except the date because I'm terrible with dates, and that won't surprise any of you in the room if you know me. (laughs) Yeah, right? There's my wife. Yeah. She's like, yeah, my gosh, all right. What day is today? I'm not actually sure. It's Sunday. Um... I remember everything about the room. I remember what was on the radio when we drove to town. I remember the, how, what, what the air felt like. I remember what I had when I had for breakfast that morning. I remember how the room smelled. I remember how the water smelled. I remember how the water felt. I remember my dad's face that day. I remember Richard Sutherland, the guy who always had jelly beans on his desk at the church. I remember that guy and the words that he said to me when he sat down. And he looked across that pew at me and he asked me those questions. And he asked me if I comprehended it. And I asked him and he smiled at me. And I remember that smile. I remember laughing. I remember being overcome when I came out of that water by this strange feeling, this strange laughter that I couldn't express. I couldn't stop laughing. I was just weeping, and my mom and I just held each other, and I just cried. I don't know why. I just couldn't stop. I remember my baptism. I was another day. Something changed me that day. Something transformed me that day, and I, Jesus started a marvelous work in me. And I remember another day, I remember another day in my junior year of high school when I got asked the question in a way I would have never expected to get asked it, but I got asked the question straight to my face, if Jesus Christ isn't the Lord of your life, what makes you think he would ever be the Lord of your salvation? And I had to think about that one. I had to think about that one, and I thought about it laying face down on the carpet in my bedroom. And I ended up praying the prayer, Lord, wherever you lead me, I'm yours. God, whatever you want, I surrender. Wherever you take me, I'll go. And forgive me for not putting you first in my life. In both of those moments, when the Holy Spirit gripped me and transformed me like I've never experienced and started a transformation in my life that I'm still working out and that my flesh is still resisting as God works it in me, that I can say three things happen so naturally that I can only explain them as the outworking of the Holy Spirit because they're not the type of things that I typically do. They're not the type of things that Henry Boyd does naturally. They're the type of things that God does through people. And the three things that I could not help but doing because the Holy Spirit moved me, they're almost like they're the, the, the things I did at first was I dove into God's Word. I dove into God's Word. It's one of the core values here at TMC. It's one of our core values because it's what it's all about. It's where the gospel is. It's where we encounter Christ always. And I couldn't get enough of it. I started reading books at a time. It just, I just couldn't. I just devoured it. It was like I was, asked, I was reading. I was asking questions. I was soaking in it. I just didn't read the Bible. I didn't get bogged down in it. No, I did the second thing, though. The second thing that came naturally to me was that I started ridding my life of sin. I started ridding my life of sin. I started getting out of it. I had this, um, like, it's almost like I came out of the water. It's almost like I came off that bedroom floor, off that carpet, and, like, just, like, I unmelted off of it, and it was like I just became immediately aware of all the sin in my life, and it was like God gave me this, like, list in my head. It was like, here's the things you need to do. You need to get them out of your life, and I only got to, like, verse 3 before my flesh started working at me again, but I started in that. I started taking those things out of my life. I started cutting that stuff out of my life. I got rid of my computer. I got rid of certain friends who were terrible influences in me. I found other people who came into my life. I, I, then I, I had a keen awareness of sin in my life. It was like I had eyes to see all of a sudden. It was like I had eyes to see. 
I remember confessing my youth pastor, who I really didn't even have a relationship with at the time. I had like zero relationship with this guy, and I just laid it all out there to him because he was there. I just laid out my life, everything I've ever done, every, every, my pride problem, the grip that pornography had had on my life. It, it was just, I just laid it out there to him, and he let me, and he prayed with me, and he was good to me, and Jesus freed me through it. I remember my family took a, like a mini vacation to Colorado that year, and it went up to this place called West, Le- West Cliff, Colorado, and we stayed at this little retreat center, and it was slowing down and disconnecting that week. It was right after this had happened, and I remember it just sort of opened my eyes, and it was like, it opened my eyes to so many other areas that after I confessed the two things that had a hold of my life, like the sin problems and the grip that I'd had on my life with, the, with that pornography problem and, and the pride in my life, once I, once I gave that to Christ, it was like Christ showed me the other things in my life that I'd been neglecting. It was like, oh my gosh, I'm a lousy son. I treat my mom like, a, like terrible. It's like, I'm a bitter, lazy, like, it's like, I was just embarrassed of it. I just got up and just went and apologized to my parents. And they're like, okay, like, <laughs> whoa, who's this? You know, it's like, I'm sorry. It's like I was coming up for air. Just flailing around. I remember that, thinking about that, just realizing I was so lethargic. And I was, I was that I was mean. And that I was really selfish with my time, with my money. With, I was just doing it for myself. Henry, Henry wouldn't do that stuff on his own. <laughs> Henry doesn't do that stuff on his own, ever. It's only by the grace of God. I remember through my own transparency and vulnerability towards God, I remember Jesus just like moving me towards other people. That's the third thing. If the first thing is I just dove into the word, the second thing is that I had a keen awareness of sin and I started ridding it out of my life. And the third thing is I started sharing my faith with other people. I couldn't help it. It was like God just kept running me into people who were like, why are you smiling so much? Why are you talking different? Those are the two things that I've had more gospel conversations in my life about. Like, I, have a, I remember in college, it's like the, the, you know, everybody wants to ask you like big questions, right? It's like, is smoking weed a sin? Is drinking a sin? Is cussing a sin, right? And you're like, okay, like before I answer any of those things, I need to tell you that I've had more Jesus conversations with, with, with people than I could ever count off of the two things that I just, I can really easily control, how I talk and that I smile a lot. It's like, those are easy. If all you have to do is talk different and smile a lot and people will just ask you why you do that, wouldn't you do that if you could have conversations with Jesus with anybody like that? It's like, yes, I would do that, right? And so it's like, people would just ask me these conversations. I was surrounded by people already who weren't Christians playing basketball, working, so might as well just, might as well just share the hope that you have. Like you didn't have a care about what anybody in the world thought of you because you were cleaned by the blood of Christ. Like you didn't have a care in the world. Have you ever experienced that freedom? That freedom only comes from surrender. That freedom only exists in surrender. I was talking to a guy the other day. I'll forget it. Look at, look at what Jesus says to the church in Ephesus in 4 and 5, right? He says, you've lost your first love. So then what? Consider how you fell. Repent. And do the things you did in the beginning. Consider how you fell. Repent and do the things you did at first. What does your life look like when you first gave it to Christ? Did you care about what kind of car you drove? Or did you just care that you were saved? I was talking to a guy the other day. He walked into a church on a Sunday evening, and he wanted somebody to pray for him. So I sat down. We talked for a bit, and he'd just gotten wrapped up in a relationship and substance abuse, and he's like, man, I'm at rock bottom. And he just wanted somebody to pray, and he said, I don't know what to do. And then he said this line that I just, 
I just stopped him. I just cut him off. He said, you probably have guys like me coming in here and asking for this stuff all the time. And I said, brother, I, you do not know how much money I would give in my life. You do not know how much money I would pay for just like three of these guys, three guys like you to walk in here and have this conversation with me. Because there's hundreds of guys across the street in that apartment complex, in that one, in that one, in these neighborhoods. There's hundreds of guys who will never walk in here and ask for somebody to pray for them. There's hundreds of guys who woke up this morning despairing and tired, who are stuck, who are hurting, who are numb, who are medicating, who don't know what's next, and they can't find their first love, whether it's their childhood faith or whether it's just the thing that made them happy last week. They can't find it again, and they don't know what to do. You do not know how much money I would give for just three of them to walk in a month. Just three of them. They can't find it because they will never do the first thing that Christ says. Consider your fall. Consider how you fell. Consider where you fell. Consider your sin. Consider where it was. The next thing Jesus says to do, the next thing he says to do is repent. Repentance is simple, man. It's, it's a confession. It's a plea for forgiveness. It's a change in direction. Repentance is so critical, and you can overlook it here in these three things that Jesus says, and you can overthink it. But what he really is is just opening yourself up to, to God. It's just opening yourself up to Jesus, surrendering to Jesus and allowing Jesus to just take control. I know a lot of guys who've considered their fall. They've got the whole thing specked out. They know it backwards and forwards. They know what their sin is. They've got it dialed in. They've got the crosshairs. They've got the target on it. They know how to get it out of their life. They even know what to do next, but they will never give up control. They won't. They'll just never give up control. Repent, Jesus says. And then he says, do the things you did at first. Back to the basics, back to the fundamentals, back to the purity of it, the innocence of it. The text parallels the love that you had at first with the works you did at the first. I think that's what Jesus wants to say in this text because he says you lost your love at first. And so the way you'll find that love at first is by doing the things you did at first. So what things did you do at first? What if... Backwards is the way forwards here. You know, we never get past the basics in church. We don't. In the, in the, in the faith, in Christianity, in the church, we never graduate from the basics of the faith. You never transcend where you don't have to take up your cross. You never transcend to the point where you can command angels to take that sympathy card to that person in your life group. <laughs> or you can, you know, drop a couple grand in the plate for a nonprofit to share the gospel with your neighbors. No, you do it. You do it. We do it. It's the things we did at first right? <laughs> we don't laugh around saying, I remember when I was just a second level Christian and I had to take up my cross. No, I, this isn't a frat, right? Stacking chairs at First Christian Church in Overbrook, Kansas is how I learned to be a Christian. <laughs> Ladling soup at the rescue mission is how I learned the love of God. Looking people in the eyes when you pour them a bowl of soup is where I saw the heart of Christ looking right back at me in places I didn't expect. There's a city and there's a church and there's a boy. So what's yours? What did your faith look like when Christ first pulled you out of that pit? When he first lit your heart on fire? What did it look like? What did you do? What, what did you think? I think about mine. 
I think about a church and a boy who somehow, by the grace of God, quit caring about what anybody in the world thought of him, and he lived his life for Jesus. That's my prerogative this week, is to try to recover some of that, is to go back and do that and get out of my house and go talk to my neighbor. It doesn't matter whether they're coming or going. It means that I'm going to change my schedule this week and I'm going to go talk to them because I haven't yet. That's what I'm going to do. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's confessing something that's had a grip on your life. Maybe it's, maybe it's waking up to the other things that you've been neglecting in your life because of this one thing that's been occupying all of your guilt and your time. I remember being immediately taken, and I was a lousy son to my parents, and that I wasn't a generous person with anything in my life, but that I held on to things with white knuckles. I realized I'd only ever read the Bible out of spite. I never really read it vulnerably. I'd never really read it open to God to change my life through it. What are yours? There's just a city and a church and a boy. In the summer, as we open up the book of Ephesians, a letter that built up the church and encouraged them to do amazing things this summer and the months to come and the years to come, this church is just going to keep on loving Jesus. We're just going to keep on pursuing Christ. We're going to keep on serving the kingdom until he comes back. We're going to keep on doing those simple things that got 10 Mile Christian Church where it is. And we're not going to overcomplicate it. It's just people. It's always been just people. This church has been doing it since any of us were born. We're just going to keep on being a light for the gospel in Meridian. We're going to keep on meeting the broken and the tired and the hurting where they're at. We're going to keep on welcoming and equipping families to grow strong in God. We're going to keep on worshiping and serving as a church across all generations. We're going to keep on challenging people to take next steps in their faith, whatever they are, wherever they're at. And we're going to keep on preaching Christ crucified, foolishness to the world. But to those of us who know him, it's the power of God and the resurrection. Amen? And maybe we be bold and honest enough to always keep Christ, our first love, at the center of our lives. And may God guide us and always make our way straight. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we come to our time of communion, I'm going to ask those of you who are serving each week, um, and God bless you for doing that at this table, to head back there. And we remember that it was the night Jesus was betrayed. He took bread, and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. Do this whenever you eat of it in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new cup, the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup proclaims Christ's death until he comes again. And we remember that it was at that same table that Christ washed his disciples' feet. No, Lord, no, you don't need to wash my feet. Not you, I should be washing your heads. You're above that. You're, you, no, Lord, you have the honor at the table. I'll sh- no, no, Lord, you've, already, you've transcended past washing people's feet. And Jesus says, no, you don't understand what type of a kingdom this is. No, you don't understand that, that it's all about the first love. Even at the table. And he serves by doing the things he did at first. All the way to the end. May we have a love that looks like that in our faith. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for Jesus. We are nothing without him. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.
Well, hey, church, thanks again for watching on online. And, you know, as we go through these times of worship, through singing, through communion, through God's word, through gratitude, everything that incorporates in our worship service, we know that God is working. We know that God is moving in our lives and in your life. And, you know, we started this new series today on Ephesians. And, and it's just a book. Like today, we just kind of was kind of week zero. You know, we're just kind of focusing on what this new series is going to be about. And it's all about just allowing God to work in our life and to understand that the gospel message is for everybody, everyone around you. This is what God wants for them is to hear the truth and to know that they are loved. And, you know, we walk through life in, in our own way where we have a lot of just different things happening in our life and maybe some struggles and maybe some difficulties that we are facing. And we just need that encouragement. We need that love and that truth in our life. And, and sometimes we just need to connect with someone to help us understand that and help us to remind us of that. And we want to be here for you. Through those difficult times in your life, through those struggles, we want to be here for you because you are a part of our church family. A couple ways that you can connect with us is by going to our connection card on our news page or in our app. Um, you can even just call the church every day, Monday through Friday. We have a minister on staff ready to receive your call. Uh, so just give us a call. We'll pray for you over the phone. We'll just talk to you. We'll listen to your story. That's what we want to do is just be here for you. Church, we are so thankful that you are a part of this worship experience with us and, and that we can gather together as one body, one family of Christ to worship our King. May your week be blessed. May your week be incredible. And if you need anything, we are here for you. God is good, and he's working even in the moments where we don't see it. God is good, and he's working. Love you, church.